to the next verse. Okay, so in my sort of division of the sutta into different sections, I call this section the ascent towards realization, and then giving it the subtitle, Practicing and Attaining the World Transcending Dharma. Then we can go to the verse itself. Tapocha Brahmacharyancha. Tapocha Brahmacharyancha. Arya Sachana Dasanam. Arya Sachana Dasanam. Nibbana Sachi Kriyacha. Nibbana Sachi Kriyacha. Etam Mangala Mutamam. Etam Mangala Mutamam. Austerity, the spiritual life. Austerity, the spiritual life. Seeing of the noble truths. Seeing of the noble truths. And the realization of nibbana. And the realization of nibbana. This is the highest blessing. This is the highest blessing. Okay, so first. Before we go into the terms in this verse itself, there's a little sort of overview of the background to this verse. Because this verse, as I said, is concerned with the attainment of the world transcending Dhamma. And to say what is the need for the, what is the meaning of the world transcending Dhamma? And what is the need for the world transcending Dhamma? And so for that, we need some of the to bring in some of the conceptual background to the Buddha's teaching. And the key principle here is that of, is called beginningless samsara, that is the round or cycle of birth and death, which is without beginning. So this is the basic condition of bondage from which the Buddha's teaching, at least the world transcending teaching, begins. So, for example, in one sutta the Buddha says that this samsara is without discoverable beginning. A first point cannot be found of beings roaming and wandering through the samsara, hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. And then he uses some examples or some similes to illustrate this. So he says, suppose you were to cut up the grass, sticks, sticks, branches, and foliage in all of Jambudipa, India, and collect them into a heap. And, it, and then when, when we're to put them down, saying for each one, this is my mother, this is my mother's mother, and so on, going back through grandmothers and great-grandmothers, back and back and back, he says, you would finish, you would exhaust all of those grasses, wood, branches in Jambudipa, but you wouldn't come to the end of your line of mothers upon mothers upon mothers. And so in this way, and so that is the case because the samsara is without discoverable beginning. And then in another sutta, he says, that, what do you think is more, the stream of tears that you have shed as you have roamed and wandered through this long course of samsara, weeping and wailing because of being united with the disagreeable and separated from the agreeable, this or the water in the four great oceans. And then the monks say, as we understand the Dhamma, the stream of tears we have shed wandering through the cycle of birth and death, this is greater than the waters of the four great oceans. And so the Buddha then says, um, for such a long time you have experienced suffering, anguish, and disaster, and swell the cemetery. So it is enough to be disenchanted with all conditioned things, enough to become dispassionate towards them, 
enough to be liberated from them. Then there's another sutta, I think it occurs in the Sangyutta Nikaya, where the Buddha says that the pile of bones that one person <laughs> wandering on for just one aeon would leave behind if somebody were to collect all of those bones and pile them up, the pile of bones would be t higher than Mount Vaipula. That was a large mountain outside the city of Rajagaha. And then as for the number of aeons that we've been wondering on, uh, yeah, one aeon, what is the duration of one aeon? Here the Buddha uses a simile of a mountain, a great stone mountain, which is a yojana long, a yojana wide, a yojana high. The yojana is about six or seven miles. So it's just one solid mass of rock. And at the end of every hundred years, a man would come along and stroke it with a piece of fine cloth. So he says that great stone mountain might be worn away in this way. But still, the aeon would not have come to an end. That is the length of an aeon. And so for so many aeons, we've been hundreds of aeons, thousands of aeons, hundreds and thousands of aeons, we've been wandering through the cycle of birth and death. But there was another sutta where a Brahmin comes to the Buddha and says, how many aeons have passed by? And then the Buddha says, it's impossible to count the number of aeons that have passed. Then the Brahmin says, can you give a simile? And then the Buddha says, can you think of the grains of sand along the river, the banks of the river Ganges? And he says, yes. And then the Buddha says, well, the number of aeons that have passed are many more times than the grains of sand of the river Ganges. And so through the cycle of birth and death, through aeon upon aeon upon aeon, we have been moving from life to life. We're born into a particular realm of existence through our ignorance and craving in ways that are governed by our karma. We live our lives creating more karma, pass away, take rebirth elsewhere. And this goes on, according to the Buddha, without a first point in time. And so the Buddha is teaching the ultimate goal is to break free from this beginningless cycle of birth and death and to realize that which lies beyond it, which is the asankata dhatu, the unconditioned state, or the deathless element, which is what the Buddha calls nibbana. And so the Buddha's world-transcending path is aimed at breaking the bonds that keep us tied to the cycle, beginningless cycle of birth and death, and in stages realizing that unconditioned state. And so here, the verse that we're currently working through begins with the quality called in Pali, the word is tapo. <clears throat> and this is referring back to an ancient Indian conception which goes back long before the time of the Buddha. <clears throat> and the word tapo, or maybe people are more familiar with the stem form tapas, in the mainstream Indian tradition signifies the undertaking of certain kinds of extreme ascetic practices, extreme austere practices of self-modification. And it's a misunderstanding to take these kinds of practices to be a kind of penance, a way of afflicting suffering on oneself is a punishment, self-punishment for one's sins. That's not the logic behind it at all. But rather the idea here is that by practicing these extreme austerities, one generates, by 
undertaking practices that are very painful to oneself, like undertaking long fasts for weeks and weeks and weeks, or subsisting on just a few grains of rice per day, sleep, sleeping on beds of thorns, exposing one's body to the heat of the sun during the day, middle of the day, or then during the cold season, bathing in the cold river, standing on one leg for long periods. So the, the purpose behind these practices is, or the idea is that by inflicting the suffering on oneself, this pain on oneself, one is generating an inner spiritual power by which one will be able to attain highest realization and along with it be able to exercise various supernormal powers like flying through the sky, diving into the earth, multiplying one's body and so forth. So these are the knowledges and skills that are supposed to come through this practice of extreme asceticism. And as we know that from the biography of the Buddha, the life story of the Buddha, the Buddha on his own quest for enlightenment practiced this kind of tapas, this kind of extreme austerity. And what he found is that it don't work. <laughs> you know, maybe you could generate these kinds of supernormal powers in this way but it doesn't lead to what he calls the higher knowledge and vision. And so the Buddha rejected that kind of extreme ascetic practice as the kind of tapas within his own discipline. But he didn't abandon the word tapas itself, but he uses tapas or redefines it to mean right effort. The right effort, particularly in mental cultivation in meditative practice. And so the Buddha sort of redefines tapas as being not afflicting, not imposing afflictions on the body, which he rejects as one of the two extremes to be avoided by a true renunciant, but rather the practice of the four kinds of right efforts. And we find actually the word tapas in a slightly different form in the Satipatthana Sutta where it has the prefix at atapi, so one dwells, sometimes this is translated as ardent, or fervent, or diligent. And so it's the four right efforts generating desire to prevent the arising of unarisen, unwholesome states of mind, and then making the effort, generating desire to abandon arisen, bad, unwholesome states, and making the effort, generating the desire to give rise to unarisen, wholesome states, and making the effort, and generating desire for the persistence and stabilization of the arisen, wholesome states and applying the effort. I just included a couple of other texts there, but not, not necessary to go through them. <clears throat> okay, so for the Buddha, the practice of tapas, we could understand to be undertaking, entering upon this life of determined effort mm -hmm. to achieve the breakthrough to the initial knowledge that will open up the unconditioned. And that takes place through that effort to train the mind by eliminating, gradually eliminating the unwholesome qualities and arousing, strengthening, fortifying the wholesome qualities. And doing this, sometimes the Buddha says that one does this with firm determination. Again, he, will, he would bring in the word upamada, heedfulness there. So it's the right effort combined with mindfulness, applied with the right effort combined with right mindfulness, 
guided by right view and with this persistent determination of the mind in striving on the path. You know, we could see maybe the development or the application of this tapas. In extending the length of time <laughs> that one is able to sit in meditation, so here you start to get some of the painful feelings coming. You know, if that's what extends the time, one does it repeatedly in a retreat context, you know, session after session after session. So then the pains start coming up, and the initial impulse is to start moving and readjusting the posture. But if one starts readjusting the posture, whenever the pains come up, first you lose the opportunity to learn how to lengthen the duration of the sitting, and one also loses the opportunity to learn how to deal with the painful feelings that arise in the body. And so it's quite natural that if one practices sitting, long periods, or sitting in sessions one after another for days on end, then pain is going to start arising in the body. But instead of just shifting the posture, then one learns to face the pain and to instead of running away from it, to turn the pain into an object of observation. And so one could just contemplate the pain itself, and then that becomes the object of meditation. And so within the pain, one could see even the characteristic of impermanence start to emerge, and the pain, what seems to be a persisting pain, is actually made up of moments of painful feeling, which are just arising and vanishing very quickly. And so they're sort of strung together so that it seems like a persisting pain, but actually each feeling is arising and vanishing, just like water bubbles. And so there you could see the quality of impermanence. And then as you endure the pain, you find that you can sit for longer and longer periods without feeling the pain. But that ability to endure the pain is, you could say, it's a kind of tapas. But of course, one doesn't want to. <laughs> Please don't take my advice to, if you're used to sitting, say, 40 minutes, 45 minutes to sit and then make the determination. This time I'm going to sit for three hours. <laughs> but it's something you have to say, gradually increase by increments the duration of the sitting. And also, um, just the thought came and it went, that's impermanence. <laughs> okay, it's gone. I just have to accept that. <laughs> oh, now I remember. Yeah, the, the Buddha describes like the, maybe this is the ideal image of tapas within the Buddha's teaching. He describes that the ideal practitioner as a monk who sits down, crosses his legs, and then makes that determination, I will not rise, even if the blood and flesh of my body dry up till only bones and skin remain, I will not rise up from this posture until my mind is liberated from the defilements. So we might read passages like that and think, ah, the Buddha praises that kind of monk, I'm going to follow that example. <laughs> but I think the Buddha is speaking in those passages, he's speaking about those who have already built up all of their requisite, prerequisite qualities, and are sort of just on the verge of enlightenment. And so they just have to make that determination to sit through for a long time, and then they can gain the goal. But we have to proceed in a more prudent, gradual, humble way until we have, we have those inner spiritual muscles. Okay, the next quality that's mentioned in this verse is 
brahmacharya. And the word brahmacharya has several shades of meaning. Like one of the meanings, especially in relation to monastic life, is celibacy. It means abstaining from any kind of sexual activity. And so the reason why the Buddha enjoins celibacy on the monastics and those firmly committed to the, to the path is because the aim of the practice is to, at least what looked at from one of the angles, is to overcome craving. And craving, the Buddha says, is the underlying root of dukkha. And so it's this craving that for sensual enjoyment that drives us along with ignorance from life to life. And so to gain liberation, one has to overcome craving. And one of the most powerful expressions of craving in human life is the craving for sensual pleasures and particularly sexual pleasure. And so the Buddha, for those who adopt the monastic life, he makes celibacy a requirement. And in Buddhist countries, what I learned is that many, well not only in Buddhist countries, but amongst long-term Buddhists, where there are married couples, and that both husband and wife are committed, seriously committed to the Buddhist path, then at some point, maybe after they've had children, and the children are reached the level of maturity, then they will take on the vow of celibacy themselves. <clears throat> so that is one meaning of brahmacharya. The other meaning is the spiritual life in its entirety. In fact, the commentary says that this particular meaning of brahmacharya, I think it says the Sakalang Magang, the entire path, the entire path is the meaning of the spiritual life. So that will be the entire practice of the Noble Eightfold Path. So we see this in this particular passage that I took from the Sutta, where a monk comes to the Venerable Ananda and says, the spiritual life, the spiritual life, what now, friend, is the spiritual life, and what is the final goal of the spiritual life? And Ananda says, this Noble Eightfold Path is the spiritual life, and then he enumerates the eight factors, and the destruction of lust, hatred, and delusion, that is the final goal of the spiritual life. Okay, so we have here a path made up of eight factors, and so one begins with right view. And right view, in the context of the Eightfold Path, is explained as understanding the Four Noble Truths. One begins with some kind of conceptual or intellectual understanding of the Four Noble Truths, and that forms, we call it maybe the framework in which one undertakes the development of the Eightfold Path. Then right view leads into right intention, right thought, or right thinking in the aspect of motivation. So the right, having this right understanding changes our purposes, our motivations, our intentions. So we have the right intention of the way it's expressed in the suttas of renunciation or detachment, the intention of goodwill, benevolence, and the intention of non-harming, not inflicting any kind of injury or pain on others. Then with right intention as the driving motivation, one undertakes the three ethical factors of right speech, right action, right livelihood. So that establishes a secure foundation of moral conduct. And then based on this moral conduct, 
one undertakes the meditative cultivation, which involves primarily the interplay or collaboration of right effort and right mindfulness, culminating in right concentration, which is usually expressed in the formula of the four jhanas. Though I'm not one who holds the view that the attainment of jhana is necessary to reach the stages of realization. The way I see it, that there are, in the suttas, if we look at them synoptically as a whole, we see many different approaches to practice laid down. Okay, so even supposing one reaches the right concentration of the jhanas, that doesn't actually mean the end of the path, but then based on right concentration, one then takes up the cultivation of insight practice, which is developing right view to a higher level. So now it's not just holding a right view intellectually or conceptually, but now one is starting to dig into the deeper layer or meaning of the truth, the first noble truth, the truth of Dukkha, by contemplating with insight the three characteristics of existence, contemplating into the impermanence of all conditioned things. So the insight into impermanence doesn't mean simply like reflecting that death is inevitable, everything will eventually come to an end, even this planet will eventually come to an end, but it's seeing in one's own person, in one's own experience, how the experience itself is constituted out of these five aggregates, material form, feeling, perception, volitional activities, and consciousness, and seeing that all of these five constituents of experience are constantly arising and passing away. And so as the insight into the impermanence becomes clearer and sharper, then one sees that within these constituents of body and mind, there's no stable basis for happiness and security, but they're all, you know, if one clings to anything amongst them, they're crumbling away deteriorating, passing away, and so one is setting oneself up for dukkha, for suffering. Okay, and then as one sees into the constant impermanence and change of the five aggregates, even going into the deepest source of the sense of self-identification, the mind or consciousness, one sees that these are all impermanent, and so one can't grasp them and identify them as being myself, what I truly am, but they're just constituents of experience that are arising and passing away. And so when they're seeing into the impermanence, now when they're seeing into the impermanence, the unsatisfactory or unstable nature, and the selfless nature of the five aggregates that constitute one's own being, that constitute one's own experience. And then when that insight will go through progressively deeper levels, bringing the, in the three characteristics into sharper and sharper focus, until at some point the mind will sort of settle upon one of the three characteristics, and then based on that insight into one or another of the three characteristics, the mind will make the transition from the contemplation of conditioned phenomena to that opening into the insight or realization of the unconditioned, which is Nibbana itself. So this is sort of said to be like passing through the door of liberation to the unconditioned, to that state of ultimate liberation. 
And with that initial breakthrough comes the seeing, the true, genuine seeing of the Four Noble Truths. But I'll bring that up for discussion in the afternoon session, because it's getting close to 10.30 now. I, we'll, we'll save the questions for the afternoon session too, because I want to complete the this verse and the verse that follows. Then we just have the rest of the afternoon open discussion. Okay, it's 10.30 and I think this is the time for the work period. Mm -hmm.